Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 103, The Brett Strode Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pippen. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we wake up the mind and body by getting a little sand between the toes with a beach walk and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest, Brett Strote, is a former teammate of mine when we played together at the University of Minnesota, and it's been so many years since we've connected. He quietly went about his business after college, pursuing his hockey passion, and carving out a pretty impressive 10-year professional career. His path took him to a lot of different destinations, finally landing in Florida, finishing his playing career in Jacksonville. His transition into coaching kept him in South Florida, where today he's regarded as one of the top hockey development coaches in the United States. This sentiment has been reinforced as he's got a long history with the USA Women's Hockey Program, being on the staff of teams that competed in the International Ice Hockey Federation Women's World Championship, the IIHF Women's World Championship, the Four Nations Cup, and was the associate head coach of the 2018 gold medal USA Women's Olympic team. He's currently the president of Hockey International Development Training and Testing, which has locations in Florida and Minnesota, is the owner of the Tampa Bay Juniors Hockey Program, and is the creator of the stick handling product Ultimate Hockey Hands. He's married and a father of two, so we got a lot to talk about. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Brett Strote to the show. Brett, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thanks, Lance. Appreciate it. You know, it's uh, it's when I started a pod, this podcast uh, about a year and a half ago, it's been just unbelievably awesome for me because I get to connect with players, coaches, uh, people that were mentors to me uh, in my past, like over 20 years ago, and you are someone that we haven't spent any time together <laughs> since we played at the University of Minnesota yeah. over 20 years ago, and you, my friend, have a hockey journey, and I'm just really excited to uh, share it with uh, my, our listeners here on the Hockey Journey podcast. Awesome. Look forward yeah. to it. So how I start all the interviews with former players that I uh, have played with, or anyone basically, is uh, I'd like you to rewind the tape and take a moment, look in the rear view mirror, and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports. Basically, tell the listeners... What the heck it was like growing up, Brett Stroder? <laughs> <laughs> well, growing up in Minnesota, you know, it's a state of hockey, so obviously uh, that became in your blood quite quickly. But, you know, we, we played all sports growing up. I uh, played soccer, uh, played baseball. Uh, you know, everyone today has backyard rinks. Uh, we had a front yard rink. We lived in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and uh, all the uh, city parks had had rinks with boards and warming houses and the city would come and flood them and sweep them and it happened to be right in there right across the street from our front yard so we pretty much had our own uh, uh, personal rink uh, with lights and everything so that's where I spent all my time uh, in the winter time and actually we play a lot of boot hockey that's a lost art uh, before the you could actually skate on the ice uh, I think that really teaches anticipation because you got to get your feet moving the other direction uh, when that tennis ball is moving so I, I think that's a lost art but uh uh, yeah, so my uh, my dad was kind of my, my coach growing up most of the years, and um, and then from there I went to Osseo High School, 
And, uh, you know, I always had a, had a dream and a goal to, to play uh, in the WCHA. It wasn't really focused on one school or another. Obviously, being in Minnesota and going to golfer games during your high school years, you'd always dream of playing for a golfer. But, you know, I've kind of learned at a young age just to kind of, you know, put your goals and dreams out there and, and let uh, the universal mind or the mind of God uh, kind of direct it and guide it. And uh, ended up playing in uh, juniors at the, uh, the USHL at Madison, Wisconsin. And at one point, I thought I was going to be going to Wisconsin, played with uh, Donnie Granado and Dennis Snedden and Johnny Bice and Rob Andringa. And, and uh, they had talked to us all about maybe playing another year juniors, or at least myself and, and uh, Granado to, to go there. But then all of a sudden, Dean Talifish uh, showed up at one of our games and uh, uh, brought me into Minnesota and the recruiting trip and, and, and the rest is history. But uh, kind of going back to how that all happened is, uh, if you remember back in the in the eighties, they started the Minnesota Massachusetts Super Series uh, yes. in eighty five when I graduated. Yes, yeah, it was like the I think it was like the third year they did it, and they they upped it up to four teams. They added Michigan and added uh, a New England team along with Minnesota Massachusetts. Well, Dean Telfus happened to be uh, the coach of that team, and and uh, and again, if you played a spring sport, um, you know you you. you couldn't play on this team and I did I didn't play a spring sport at that time and so I was kind of the last guy picked uh Chuck Grillo actually recommended me from uh, my days at Minnesota hockey schools and I uh, was kind of the, the the 13 forward going out there but I just you know always learned just to be responsible and respectful and accountable and work hard and and by the end of the tournament Dean really liked the way I played and uh, kind of followed my path uh while I was playing juniors because uh, he he now became the the coach at the uh assistant coach at the University of Minnesota and and so, you know, that, that's all, you know, things work out. You never really know, you know, who, who you're crossing paths with and, and who one day may, uh, may, may, may uh, you, know, you know, bring you in. So that, that's, uh, that's how I ended up there. You know, it's interesting because I don't remember, well, I can say this. I, I totally remember that you were not the fastest player that I've ever skate, uh, played with. Uh, <laughs> but you weren't the slowest player either. Uh, but right now you're going really fast. On, on your hockey journey and you're being you're being modest uh, and that happens a lot with the uh, people I get on here um, let's just go back to when you were a kid I you know your I know your dad was a huge influence on you uh, you mentioned that already um, just tell me a little bit about how he gave you maybe an intangible that you were completely unaware of but it, it fueled you to, to accomplish what you accomplished. Yeah, but it's, looking back at it, my dad was probably one of the best coaches I've ever had, not really known at the time, because my dad didn't play hockey, um, you know, growing up. I mean, he skated at the ponds and, and, the, and the rinks outdoors. Um, and so his approach was always, obviously work ethic was a big one and, and discipline and things like that, but – uh, he taught me how to visualize at a young age and, and how to use, you know, my sense of sound and sense of feel and, and peripheral vision. So I, I kind of grew up thinking everyone, you know, was visualizing um, at a young age. When I got into coaching, I realized a lot of people didn't really know what that still was. And so so that was kind of my foundation. Yeah, I didn't wasn't really the fastest um, as a player. But when you anticipate, and that, that was my, my game, was just always reading body language of other players, their sticks and their hips and and always getting a head start, I, I guess, and, and anticipation is a feeling. So you create that feeling of what you think is going to happen in front of you. And so that was something that I learned at a, at a young age. And uh, no, no question had, had an impact on, on me uh, being able to you know, play Division One college hockey, especially at the University of Minnesota. So for where, what, what's his background? Was he just a, a, a late night person that i mean the internet wasn't even going on then uh, you know when you're talking about visualization read and react anticipation uh that's cutting edge stuff back when we were i mean that that was the early late 70s early 80s i mean is that what he specialized in or is the what, how did he know this no, no he, he was just a carpenter <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. I mean, well, he, he understood the mind and I think a lot of it was Herb Brooks, you know, Herb Brooks being the coach in the seventies and they're at the university of Minnesota. So, you know, my dad would read the paper and things like that. And he knew that, they, you know, the, the, the mind played a, a big part of the game. And, um, but yeah, to, to answer that question, I, I really don't know, but he, I mean, I would be visualizing nights before games and, and, um, 
it was just always about preparation. You know, he was really big on all, the whole team, you know, all to the coaches, all the players to be prepared mentally and to visualize, uh, you know, different sh- your shifts and, and uh, you, you know, the, the, the for, your, your forecheck or just where your players are. Uh, you know, another thing, too, I, I knew what hand everybody was. You know, I, you know Lance Pitlick, right-handed, Randy <laughs> Carter, right-handed, Ken, Ken, Kenton Hander, left-handed. So that's another thing, too, that I learned at a young age that, to know what hand everybody was. And so even back when I was a PUE in a band in high school, you know, the, the, the first week of training camp, I'm looking around the room. And if I didn't know, and knowing mean exactly just the thought of Lance Pitt, I could just picture him being right-handed yourself being right-handed, uh, you know, Larry Oldham left-handed. I can just, you know, I wasn't prepared. And, and again, that that's a, a big part of the game now today, the way it's a, a skillful game and a, and a puck possession game, you have to pass the puck on the proper side of the body on the forehand side whenever, whenever possible. And I, I think a lot of it too, uh, Lance is, uh, you know, the Soviets had a big impact on us, you know, back, you know, obviously with the miracle on ice, uh, with Jack Blalowick, um, you know, just, just in Minnesota in general and Boston, because of all the players from that team, uh, you know, just, we, you know, we kind of saw the game through, through their eyes a little bit with, with, with puck possession and creativity. So I started to interrupt. I don't know if you're going to continue there. I just totally stopped you. Nope, no, no. Um, yeah, man, that is awesome. Uh, the preparation part of it. We, you know, talking about your dad. Um, we all have mentors in our life, and um, for me, my hockey life was. I didn't have anyone that mentored me as far as my mom or my dad. My mom and my dad, they gave me the opportunity. They put skates on my feet and let me play the game. But the people that helped me get to um, the level that I was able to achieve, and similar to you, was not by my mom and dad. Um, it was by other people. So you talk about... Uh, we we might have the longest episode ever. It could be <laughs> week long because there's so many things to talk yeah. about. Um yeah, one of the one of the uh, biggest influences uh, mentors for me was a guy named Jack Blatherwick, and both of us had him as a coach uh, at the University of Minnesota. And the guy was I don't know how you categorize him. He he's not in a relationship. He's been by himself. I don't know how long. My kid is playing at the University of Minnesota. He has been part of his life. Uh, for the last few years, not like a training standpoint, but he's he's been where he's been training. He's been poking his head in and stuff like that. I mean, I, I think he's in his seventies now, but he tutored me to get <laughs> one summer to get me through college algebra because during I think it was my freshman or <laughs> sophomore season, I was failing college algebra and I had to you know. Yeah, stop it or whatever and then retake it in the summer he tutored me twice a week <laughs> for the whole summer and I got a flipping D in algebra and he said Lance I have <laughs> no idea I, I've given you everything I know but for some reason this <laughs> does not work with you but anyway so Jack Blatherwick very influential uh, to both of us how impactful was he to you I mean we're, we're going to talk about your dad uh, after this, but uh, he was a pretty special man, not only from uh, mentoring people, but just the knowledge that he had. And how did he influence you to what you're doing today? Yeah, no, uh, Jack's uh, been an incredible mentor, incredible friend. Uh, we still stay in, in touch today. Um, you know, just to a little backstory. I first met Jack probably in 1983 at the Minnesota hockey camps up there in Brainerd, uh, Chuck Grillo and Jack. And, and he was testing us back then with the, with the photo cells and, and, it was, you know, and he had the presentation of, you know, here's where you are today, but if you really want to play at a higher level or D one level, you know, you got to get down to here. So I saw where some of the faster guys in the, especially in Minnesota or just throughout the country that would go to that camp. And I remember Chuck Grillo, we were sitting out there uh, on the, uh, on a patio by the canteen there and, there's about 12 of us, and, and uh, it was just after Jack's uh, presentation, you know, with our test scores and what you got to do to get faster, more explosive. And and uh, I never never forget, you know, Chuck said, you know, everyone's going to leave here excited about Jack's program and training, but he says only maybe like 5% are actually going to follow through with it. And, and I said to myself, I'm going to be one of those 5%. 
And so I, you know, went back and started doing sprint training, got a weight vest and, and lo and behold, all of a sudden I'm at the university of Minnesota and Jack Palalabuk's there. And I still have a key to the dungeon today. I think, I think you might've had a key back yes. when Jack, I still have it today. I, Cause it uh, means a lot to me, you know, Jack, you know, for him, you know, Hockey teams back then really didn't have their own specific weight room. Jack created that for us. He created study halls for us. So he's just a guy that just has a great heart, that just really cares about people and and uh, still still today. So I, I owe a lot to Jack, a lot of what I do, how I coach. I see the game through through the eyes of speed. Through, I still test through Jack Blalowicz's testing program with the, with the photo cells and the graphs. Um, we brought Jack in with the women's uh, the Olympic team back in 2018. Rob Stauber and myself, uh, Jack became a uh, consultant for us uh, with them as well. So, so he, he's uh, changed a lot of lives and has helped helped a lot of people in the sport of hockey and beyond. Yes, and he's currently doing it. I mean, how old is he? Is he in his 80s yet, or is, is he late 70s? He's the guy's this timeless. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know he's a, yeah in the seventies again. I, I don't I don't even know how old I am, so I don't think about it. So, so we we don't talk about that. But yeah, yeah, he, he's getting up there. But there's a my my son went uh, a a guy that we played with, Dave Snuggerud, started a uh, hockey academy um, in Chaska. I believe that's the the where it is right now. They got a couple two or three locations now. But uh, a a player there, his name's Mike uh, Kester who is uh, playing at the University of Minnesota defenseman there. For some reason, he got connected with him, and uh, I've coached that kid since he was in third or fourth grade, um, and that's one of the reasons that my son ended up down in uh, uh, Chaska at Breakaway Academy. But Jack Jack is this always uh, in people's kitchen um, and helping. You know, he's asking, can I cut the vegetables? <laughs> he's not asking when we're eating. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about, because this was, it was the same time for us. You talk about the dungeon. That was our, our gym. And uh, you you look at people that, if you hear stories of people that, where they're putting in time, getting better. Um, the dungeon was our, our off-season spot to, to sweat we put in the sweat equity there and it was a uh, it was the across the street from the hockey arena was the old football stadium and there was a tunnel correct from um, from our spot over there and uh, we converted that we because we did uh, Jack as well converted that into a weight room and then you you mentioned study hall and then there was one other room. I want to see if you can remember what that room was. Uh, just tell me what your recollections are of, uh, of that space because we spent a lot of time together there. Yeah, well, yeah. So it, it was the old football locker room um, that, that we converted into the, the dungeon. Jack had a bunch of pictures of, uh, you know, of, of uh, past uh, go, go for greats. And then, uh, yeah, we had, we had the weight room there. We had the study hall room. We also had the, where we could shoot pucks in the back area there. Uh, Jack would hit golf balls back there sometimes. Uh, you know, he had had his slide had his slide boards, and then uh, and and then I remember the, the big open bathroom. Do you remember milk? Oh yeah, well that's right. Well yeah, so uh, Doug Wu did a did a commercial with uh, a sponsorship with uh, the Land Lakes. Was yes, back then? Uh, yeah, and, and and the chocolate milks would be uh, sitting in, in that other room there, and uh, yeah, people would bring their backpacks down there and. Uh, Phil up, uh, so he was, he was way ahead of his time. I mean, he knew the protein and chocolate milk. I remember seeing a commercial just recently, them talking about it. I said, boy, Jack knew about that in 1988. Yeah. And he, he was just, just so far ahead of his time. And, and still, you know, the, the, the hockey culture, hockey environment still hasn't, as a whole, hasn't really latched on to, you know, his overspeed training uh, of what you really need to do to help players get faster and develop the stamina to play at top speed, especially from ages 13 to 16. There's you know, new information out that that's the prime time, you know, physiologically speaking, to really develop that speed and that stamina to play at top speed. But we got to train with, at, with top speed inter- intervals like, like Jack Cat is doing. Yeah, so. um, yeah I, and I... Everything you 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 mentioned today, Brett, that uh, kind of connected with you at that time, uh, it it just bounced off my head like, like a meteor and something. Uh, yeah. we, it didn't connect with me, um, 
But what's interesting is that, you know, after my career, probably in the last uh, 20 years, is that it did connect with me. And what he was throwing out there, uh, I remember certain comments. And when we met uh, last week after, geez, was it over two decades that you and I had seen each other? Um, it was, it was like nothing passed. I mean, I saw you, we talked, we talked, I, I thought I was back in the locker room at the university of Minnesota, with yeah. you. but, uh, yeah. you know, we've, we've accumulated a lot of, uh, experiences over the time. So, um, just talk to, we, we had a, an unbelievable time at, uh, the university of Minnesota. I mean, I don't know how many people can say that they went to the final four, Three, three or two or three out of the four years that they were there. Because were you there all three? We we were we were there the the whole yeah you know, three out of yeah. four years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you know that that's that that was an impressive deal. And we don't have to spend too much time talking about losing to Harvard. Uh, but <laughs> but what was the getting a college scholarship or playing college hockey? What was that? What what did that mean to you? And then um, you know, for the two of us to be teammates, it was pretty cool doing what we did. Uh, what do you remember of that? Yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier, you know, I, I had a goal and a dream to play in the WCHA, and you know, obviously playing at Minnesota, you know, was the the, the, the pinnacle to be able to play in your home state. Uh, and again, there's, I didn't really see myself as one of the top players coming out of high school hockey but you know uh coaches they, they look for different aspects and players and and so i was very blessed to, to to be there and and uh you know a lot of what i do now is, is because of my time there um you know and again to, to be able to I, I didn't play in the first frozen four my, my freshman year but you know i was there but then you know to play in two out of those three frozen fours you know was, was incredible and you know, we're basically one game away from from going to a fourth Frozen Four, lo- losing to Boston uh, in a two out of three series, our, our senior year. So it, it's pretty incredible to be one of the an, an organization, a program uh, that was you know basically one or two in the nation for uh, qu- quite a few weeks. You know, during th- th- that time yeah. frame, and you know, obviously we, we had a great coaching staff with the late Doug Woog and and Billy Butters and and uh, you know, D- uh, Dean Talfus and Paul Otsby and Bob Shire. Yes. Uh, we also, you know, had some some great players as well, and you know, I learned a lot from my college roommate Rob Stauber. Um, you know, he, you know, I, I was like I said earlier, I you know visualized a lot, so I knew the mental side of the game. But just living with him and you know playing golf and playing darts and playing cards, I, you know, he, he had something I didn't have. You know, he he would win with his mind, and, and you saw that uh, in '88 when he won the uh, Hobie Baker Award. You know, uh, you know, he wanted to make that '88 Olympic team, and when he didn't make it, you know, he, he never said a negative word about it. Um, but he just came in with the, with a mindset that uh, he was even going to be better. And so I, I was able to, to witness that and uh, and see that on a, on a daily basis and just really impacted me that, wow, he, his mind took it to another level. And so, you know, it helped me uh, to, throughout, throughout my journey as well. So, so yeah, I'm very grateful uh, and, and, and very blessed to, uh, to uh, have, have played at the University of Minnesota as a Golden Gopher. So just to get people up to speed that you don't know, Rob Starber was a teammate of ours, a uh, goaltender. And where was he from? Duluth. Duluth, Duluth Denfeld. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he brought Denfeld down to the state Yes, Duluth, Duluth Denfeld. Um, but he ended up winning the Hobie Baker, and he was on a different level. And I'm glad that you brought that up because you don't, you know you're you're blessed if you are able to play with someone that is going to be in the the conversation of being nominated for the Hobie Baker Award, uh, let alone winning the dog doggone thing. But what I find interesting is that how incredible that guy was. Uh, it just shows you how hard it is to to make it in the NHL. You just need so many. You know, just to make it in pro hockey, you had a 10-year professional career as well. Um, and it, it's hard to be an everyday player at the highest level. So I'm grateful that you were able to uh, witness what, 
what he had, but there was a connection already with you two because you were already doing visualization and people say that goalies are weird. Uh, I just, I, I, I say that they, they were ahead of the game, like you said, that they, they understood the mental part of the game way before any of the skaters. Oh, no, no, no question. And looking back at it, uh, a goalie is kind of like an individual position because, you know, if they make a mistake, there's no one to back right. them up. So if a forward makes a mistake, you have defenders and defenders have the goalie and so forth. So so individual sports always, you know, visualize, you know, whether they're divers or whether they're tennis players or golfers. You'd always see them close their eyes. Jack Nicklaus was a, was a big visualizer. They all, they all do. And, uh, and and goalies, they, they knew that uh, – that, that they had to be at their best because there was no one to bail them out. So, so yeah, they they, uh, they had to be the strongest uh, uh, mentally uh, on the team. And but I think if we learn from that as players, and you're seeing it now, even in the NHL, it's becoming more you know the, the mindset and, and the energy. I mean, look look at the Florida Panthers. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing what they've been able to accomplish. You know, kind of sneaking in at the <laughs> final hour of the playoffs and and, and how they uh, are, are you know are on their way to. Uh, to the Stanley Cup uh, Finals, but again, it, it, it everything you've been saying so far, you know, you talk about the Florida Panthers just getting in. I mean, they just got into the playoffs, and that's the number one objective. Let's, let's just get there, uh, and all of a sudden, that team has the belief that they can win a freaking Stanley Cup now, and uh, they're in the finals, and the mind is a huge part of it. Uh, do you, do you attribute that to your dad as far as introducing that to you and to make that something that is part of your daily ritual, I guess, right now? Well, I attribute it to both my mom and my dad. My mom was the spiritual leader of the family. Really? You know, then my dad got us in, in, into sports, and so it was a combination. Um, you know, uh, God talks about a lot about transforming your mind and renewing your mind. That's what it's all about. And, you know, and so it, sports is a great way to uh, apply these principles, uh, to see things differently, to change the way you look at things and the things you look at will change. And so, so at a young age, I, I kind of had those, those, those two, uh, concepts and, 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 and sports is a great way to kind of practice those principles to, you know, rise to a higher consciousness, I guess. Uh, and, it, and it's through your imagination. Uh, your imagination is the most powerful tool. The, uh, you know, the greats all play through their imagination. They just use their five senses to pull information in. Their imagination can fill in the blank. You don't need to see the hockey net. You see a, a piece of what looks like the net. Your imagination fills in the blanks that, you know, four by six. And that's why the great goal scorers don't necessarily need to see the net and, and things like that. So, so I was on that path at a young age. And so I, you know, I, so, so two things, I never believed in the concept that you can't teach speed, and I never believed in the concept that you can't teach hockey sense. So even back in our day, though, that's what was told, that you can't get any faster, you can't develop hockey sense. And, but it's all what you believe, and so if you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And so I believed you could, and so my journey, to, if people would just come into my life, like I think I told you, Lawrence Seagrave and Jim Radcliffe, some, some of the two uh, top track and field uh, uh, sprint coaches, uh, when you learn from the best, you're like, oh wow, you know, we don't even know how to how to yeah. run, or and, and just same with hockey sense. I would just, you know, things would just just come my way, and so that's so me getting into coaching, and especially with the women's Olympic team, you know, we, we saw the game through the eyes of the mind and through the eyes of the senses more so than the, through the eyes of structure. Now you got to have structure, you know, your X and O's, your power play, kind of like through your D zone. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, I'm kind of going off here on tangents, no, no, your mind, but. With the uh, with the women's Olympic team, we trained for six months, you know, leading up to the you know the biggest game of their life, right here in in, in Tampa, Florida, in Wesley Chapel, uh, where the rank I'm out of right now. And again, I had I got a whole new appreciation for the Olympics because um, I was a, a camp coach for two years with Katie Stone uh, leading up to the 2014 Olympics. So I, I wasn't a bench coach, and I would just go to their camps and you know and you know kind of gave them some of my thoughts and ideas. But it was their decision to do what they do. And uh, and then all of a sudden I, I became one of the coaches uh, with uh, Rob Stauber and Paul Marr eventually, uh, you know, leading into 2015. But here you are. If, if when you lose that gold medal game in 2014, like they did, uh, it's not like a World Championships where you can uh, you have the, the next year you can redeem yourself. I mean, you have to wait four years, yeah. and so that, that's, <laughs> that puts it to a whole other perspective. And so here we are getting ready to the, the biggest game of their, uh, their life, and you know, to redeem themselves from four years prior. 
Uh, this is this is a true true statement. We, we worked on D zone coverage for one practice for 20 minutes, you know, five on five in the D zone. And the only reason we did it because the women were kind of like wondering, well, are we going to work on this? Uh, but but they knew the D zone coverage, and, and our philosophy was if we can get faster and, and have better stamina to play at top speed, you're going to have less breakdowns. And if you have a better mindset, where you're not going through these ebbs and flows of the game, because a lot of these ebbs and flows are, are just because of the way our brains wired. It doesn't have to be that way. We, we just wired our brains when there's a two goal lead to have like oh, uh, 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 you know kind of relaxed uh, moment because we've been doing that since we were ten years old. We're up two goals. That doesn't have to be that way. Um, and and so and, and if you see the game through the senses and you, and you have better awareness of where you are in relationship to your teammates and relationship to the the the, uh, the other team again all those things are going to be better and so that's what we really focused on what was um, what, what was those three pillars more so than the the structure side of the game. See, so talk you know, we're we're talking about the the highest level uh, for women's hockey. I, I I don't know if they would say professional would be the highest level, but I think the Olympics would be the highest level. Um, sure. Yep. You're talking about mental training. I'm hearing this mental training, uh, you know, that you're focusing on that. Did you guys have uh, specific sessions that focused on that? And who was leading that charge? Did you bring someone in? Yeah, so Dr. Colleen Hacker, uh, she was a sports psychologist, a uh, very renowned sports psychologist. And, and again, she was part of uh, the group uh, leading up to the 2014 Olympics, and you know, great information, great knowledge, very knowledgeable. Uh, they learned a lot, but 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 uh, the difference was it took coaches like myself and Rob, and you know, who uh, really understood the, the you know the mental side of the game, and was able to apply those principles and concepts in real time. You know, uh, in between shifts, in between yeah. periods. Yeah. Uh, um, just to, just to give you an example, um, you know, we're in 2015 at the World Championships in uh, Malmo, Sweden. And, uh, you know, we're, we're winning the game and, and you know, we got a, a two goal lead and I knew this was coming. All of a sudden there's a, l- a little setback and all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they tied it up. And so after the second period, you know, it, it's a tie game, I think five, five, if I remember correctly, but, but we lost all the momentum because once you let all that energy out of your body, it's tough to recover. Um, and so, you know, we had them close their eyes and, and had them go through all five of their senses, and, you know, to, to see determination and to hear it and to smell it and to, and to taste it. And, and it works. I mean, right now, me talking to you about it, I can feel energy being just immediately uh, energized in my body. And we went out there and, and uh, took it to them and, and, and beat them 7-5. But, the, but again, it, it was the energy. It wasn't about any structure or any anything else. It was about the energy. And then you know, it's, and it's, but it's, it's storing that energy, Lance, because a lot of times we, we, we let energy just leak out of us because we're upset with the referee call or upset because referee didn't call that penalty on us or them. And yes. so our, our brains are wired to leak a lot of energy. So we have to rewire our brains or transform our mind or rewire our minds. And so that's what we did with the, with them is that, Hey, when the referee makes a bad call, you, you, you can't change that call. Don't even let it bother you. And so it's, it's one thing about them. They're aware of that, Oh, it's, it's changed. And, 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 and again, you're just looking at things differently. And, and if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. And so all of a sudden, now you're not worried about the referee. All of a sudden, it doesn't bother you no more. You know, referee makes a bad call before you get all rattled and frustrated. Well, you rewrite your brain. It doesn't bother you. Well, now you've got more energy in your body. You're not, you're not poking holes in yourself. And so we, so we, uh, we went through a lot of lists of things, and, uh, but, but they have to apply it. And so that was great with working with them is that, uh, you know, they, they applied it. And again, they had the information from Dr. Clean Hacker about how important the mind is and these different other things we did with them. But now to really have uh, people on, in real time, you know, day to day in practices and in games and uh, in between periods to kind of reinforce and what things they should be doing right now to help uh, rewire their brain, so to speak, uh, you know, that, that, that was paramount. I'm down here in South Florida, uh, not with you, but near you. And Right now, I'm sitting in a, uh, my son went to uh, Shattuck. He lived with a the family. They own this house that we're staying at that they're living, letting us stay for free, so thank you. But I'm sitting here with my arms crossed, smiling about what you're saying right now. Uh, just, awesome. just great messaging, Brett, uh, unbelievable. Um, and I hope that everyone that's gonna hear this episode is uh, gonna take that as a, a learning nugget because there's so many great uh, teaching points here. Um, let's talk about you a little bit, my friend, because you had a 10-year professional career. You didn't make it to the NHL. 
Um, do you, are you proud of it? Are you happy? Do you, was there some unsolved business or are, can you walk away from that saying, you know what, I emptied the tank and I did whatever I could to reach the highest level I could achieve? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, in, you know, what, what, what comes your way, just, just make the best use of it. And, uh, yeah, I would have loved to have gotten to the NHL, uh, but looking back at it, you know, Lance, uh, you know, it's not, I really didn't have, it wasn't, what's the best way to put this? Um, uh, I, I read, uh, talking to Donnie Granado, uh, before he became the Buffalo Sabres coach. Uh, you know, I played with him at, at, uh, in the USHL and juniors and and I remember a conversation Donnie said he was talking to his brother Tony and, and he asked Tony you know when did you believe he could make the NHL and Tony said like back when he was like 12 13 years old and and you know and, and Donnie was like well maybe that was my problem because I, I didn't really see it until later and, and I, I was kind of the same way is that uh, you know I just I wanted to make the high school varsity team and then once I got there I was like you know what you know yeah, I can play uh, D1 I felt and then you know but then when I got there it was like the NHL but you know um, I, I probably should have had that that dream and, and vision earlier. Uh, Tommy Peterson comes to mind. I mean, he was he was a kid that he, he was going to make the NHL. I, I talked to Tommy, and you know, we watched, remember him as a freshman. You know, and he, he was kind of a smaller defenseman, and uh, but boy, he had a belief. He had a belief that he was going to play, and you know, hats off to him. So I think that's I guess that's where I'm going with it. I don't know if I really had a, a strong strong belief like I did. I had a strong belief to play D1. I, I didn't have that strong belief back then, so that that's important. To have that but yeah uh, i really enjoyed my journey uh, met a, a lot of great people a lot, and a lot of great coaches and um you know uh, I, I met my wife th- uh, through that journey um you know I, I played a little bit in knoxville one time and oh this is kind of nice playing in the south because being from minnesota you really only knew minnesota michigan or massachusetts <laughs> back yes. then and you know and then a couple years later i was in Birmingham, alabama Alabama, and I said, well, this is even a little bit warmer. You can play golf all year, but it was still kind of gray, and, you know, the leaves would fall. And all of a sudden, I ended up in Tallahassee, Florida with Terry Christensen, another Minnesota guy who was at Michigan State uh, back when we were playing, assistant coach there. Um, boy, what a, um, uh, every day I'm looking up at the sky. It's, it's clear blue skies, and it's just like, wow, you can have this, and all the, the, the greenery and stuff like that. And my wife uh, went to school at, at Florida State there in Tallahassee, and and so that's how I ended up here. So, so yeah, that was the journey I, I was supposed to be on. And, and uh, again, I, I learned, learned a lot, a lot of great things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, very proud of what I was able to accomplish. So let's talk a little bit about uh, you, you had a, a 10-year professional career and you lived in a suitcase, basically, because <laughs> you, yeah. you played in a lot of different places. Uh, but congratulations on that uh, someone to, to, to keep at the journey um, and just hearing you right now uh, I just you talk about supercomputers uh, your brain is a supercomputer because you my friend are, are just downloading stuff and uh, if anyone is blessed to have a conversation with you they know that uh, if they're into hockey that they're talking to someone they better listen to because you know a lot uh, I, I, I just, your experiences that you had, even though you didn't make it to the NHL, my friend, uh, you are benefiting so many other people because of the experiences and what you're passing on. Uh, so that's incredible. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your transition from uh, being a player, because I believe you had a year or two where you were a player coach before you... Uh, transition to full-time coach is that is that what happened yeah so uh i was uh pretty much done playing in 1996 um actually my my last year playing in the east coast hockey league was in jacksonville florida and i had actually just got married and and retired Uh, i had some health issues i uh had crohn's disease kind of early in my career and um i'm i'm relieved of it now and so but so that that had a lot of effect on my play uh throughout throughout the years um but uh bruce cassidy was uh, was the coach there it was his first year coaching no way uh, in the east coast hockey wow. league yeah so it's amazing <laughs> amazing how um how things go and um and, and then uh yeah i got into coaching after that 
and then uh, you know Ron Dugay is a good friend of mine. Uh, he, uh, he had moved down to Jacksonville at the same time uh, I did. He was married to Kim Alexis, and they had a connection with Jacksonville. So, so there there became a new league called the S uh, SPHL, I believe, Southern Professional Hockey League, and became the WHA two, I think, at one time. So, so we we were coaches there, and I wasn't really a player coach. It was just kind of by <laughs> necessity at those leagues that uh, we ran out of play. I would, Needed a couple of players, and uh, so I just kind of jumped in some games. We actually had Rob Stauber come down and play some games. No uh, way! And so, are you, so are you, no way! Yeah. Like literally, you yeah, needed I, a guy I, to play, and you would suit up. No way! So yeah, so I so I, I suited up and, and played a handful of games uh, those years. So I really wasn't the player assistant. I was really the assistant coach, and just you know played some <laughs> games. So it, it's kind of like a slap shot. Slap shot wasn't wasn't that far far wow. fetched. <laughs> So you, you get into that, and then how does HockeyInternational.net uh, become HockeyInternational.net? Well, yeah, like I said, I, I just I saw the game through the eyes of, of speed through our mentor, Jack Balathewick. And so, uh, you know, Jack uh, allowed me to uh, take his, his, uh, his approach and, and his testing, um, you know, to, uh, out uh, to other, other parts of the U.S. and training and also, um, you know, just uh, Hockey International, just, you know, had some international uh, players come in from like, like Finland and things like that. Uh, and so that, that's how, how I got started. It was just a, a training program that, um, that I started up and uh, don't do it as much anymore, but uh, would do summer training programs. But we, we had the Ivy League guys uh, come down and during COVID, um, yeah, it was through Hockey International. Uh, we had about 18 Harvard guys and some Brown and Dartmouth guys come down. They were looking for a place to, to train and, and and play a little bit during uh, why, why their season got canceled. So so that was part of Park International as well. So so it just started taking the things that I learned and, and uh, you know incorporate the, the the speed of uh, of our feet and the speed of the hands and the speed of the mind, kind of like like Tarasov back then uh, with the Soviets. So those are the three main areas that are, that are really concentrate and focus on. Do you read a lot? Yeah, yeah, I, I read no, a lot. No, not uh, today. Do you through, read a lot today, or do you listen to podcasts? Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of both. Okay. Yep, I'm always picking up ideas. Yep. What uh, What are you focusing on now? Anything? Well, uh, nothing specific because I kind of when things come my way, but you know, you know, like the the, the talent code or you know Joe, some books by Joe Dispenza, you know, just different things about about the mind and how, how to tra- transform the mind and. Um, you know, obviously, if, if there's some things on, on speed, but but mostly uh, m- mental stuff, uh, kind of get into the neuroscience and quantum physics. So, you know, you'd be surprised how once you learn it, it it, it, it translates over. Have you ever so, Have you ever thought about writing a book? Yeah, I I do have a a, a book proposal uh, called the Become the Greater You. It's the power of uniting the mind, body, and spirit. Nice. Uh, so I, I do I do have a uh, a proposal that I've lined out and just been kind of sitting here. So yeah, it's kind of funny you, you, you ask because it's uh, uh, you know it's it, it's kind of the inside story of the 2018 women's Olympic team, how they manifested their goals and dream of winning gold. But uh, but it's really just kind of it's more about just the overall coaching and training philosophy that I've had over the years, and you know obviously them being women Olympic gold, it, it, it was kind of easier to kind of. Uh, maybe use that story to implement some of these things and you know things like it started with the vision you know we had a vision and we created a highlight tape because they didn't know who the Soviets were really back then and so we created a highlight tape of you know some of the Soviet teams of the you know 70s and 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 really what their game looked like with with uh, puck control and, and, and creativity and, and speed and you know, then we then we had a process and it started with uh, you know character and you know that's where it all starts you have to you know, elevate your character and, and, you know, teach players how to play through their responsibility and, and their initiative, you know, to back check through their initiative and, and to be responsible with their sticks. What, what Jamie Ben just said, he, he, he wasn't responsible, wasn't accountable. And, and, and uh, you know, with, with that uh, cross check on, on Mark Stone yeah. there. And again, even, even at the, even at the highest level, players still need to be re- reminded, but there's a way to elevate your character that our parents have instilled in us. And then, and help you become that player and so so your character just your responsibility just pulls that stick away from uh from slashing someone or tripping someone and and so you know that's where it starts and then it's you know then it's 
and then it's having an elite mindset. Uh, you know, just because we react a certain way doesn't necessarily mean it's elite. And so I, I just I remember, you know, I used to study Michael Jordan, or you know, we we're fortunate to see the greats like Michael Jordan and uh, Larry Bird and Tiger Woods in, in their in their in their prime, and you just saw how their minds uh, took over games. And I remember vividly watching a, a Roy Firestone interview on ESPN years ago, probably in the nineties, and. But he was interviewing the Boston greats. He was interviewing Bobby Orr and Ted Williams and Larry Bird. And, and you know, they're all retired, you know, for some time. And a couple of things that stood out to me is, is you know, he, they were going through Larry's accolades of you know, his high school basketball in Indiana and then, you know, going to a national championship game. And then, you know, his Celtics or, uh, um, you know, the a- a- NBA trophies. And Roy Firestone looked at him and said, Larry, when did you realize you were better than everybody else? And there was a long pause, and it was kind of odd and awkward because normally they would just spit something out. And Larry looked after about, I don't know, 15 seconds and said, I never thought I was. <laughs> so, so again, you know, the, the, the greats, their, their brains are wired differently. He just wanted to be the best. You know, Wayne Gretzky wanted to be the best. We said he was the best. He, so, they, so it's a little bit different there. But also Larry Bird, what, what really caught my attention was, he was talking about his preparation and and how he would feel sick to his stomach that he wouldn't be at his best when they played the L.A. Clippers, you know, the doormat of the NBA back then. It was easy for him to get up for the L.A. Lakers and Showtime and, and Magic. and uh, But he would spend so much time and energy. And so that's what we kind of instilled in our women's Olympic team and all the teams that I coach is that it was, it's easy to get up for Canada. You can feel that energy, you know, two days before the game. and uh, But when you're playing a, a lesser team, uh, in, in the rankings or team that you've beat uh, for, the, for the last, you know, three, four, five years, you know, the en- energy is not there. Well, it wasn't good enough anymore. We had to trick our minds as, as if we were playing Canada every single game. And it was fun to watch the transformation. All of a sudden now we're playing Sweden, Germany, or whoever it was, and you could just feel the energy on a pregame skate or the night before. Uh, and then now they're playing consistently at their best because that's what the greats want to do. They, they want to be at their best. They're not looking at games we're going to win or lose. They, they want to be at their best every game and they know if they're at their best their chances of winning are going to be, be pretty good so so it's a, just a different way of thinking so i kind of really you know so the answers are there that, you know it's called geniuses give you clues if you if you listen it's always been there visualization's always been there um you know and like i said jack nicholas used to talk about it back in the back in the early 80s and late 70s and so so the, the geniuses will give you those clues it's just you know are, are we receptive to them are we open to them and and are aware that hey that this is something that we could could use and so that was something that i've, I've always done and and uh things just kind of come my way and when it catches my attention then yeah i'll sit down and read the book or, or watch the podcast so you're you're an innovator as far as i'm concerned i mean you're you're cutting edge and you're always pushing forward um uh, i get in front of a lot of players that have lofty goals brett um everything that you're talking about here as far as mindset how do you train that? What What are some recommendations to, to get a, a stronger mind that uh, players could be working on right now? Well, a couple things. Um, first of all, it, it's awareness that uh, you're, well, it's, it's all about energy. And so, our, you know, if you study, like, you know, read some books on, you know, like, start getting into neuroscience or quantum physics you know everything's a vibration so even the chairs that we're sitting on it's not solid it's a vibration i know i'm kind of getting uh, i like that it. keep but going, keep going. Re- yeah well and what they say is you know it's it's uh 99.999 with 12 nines energy and vibration and then it's only 0. 0.0000 with 12 zeros and a one after it uh of, of, of physical matter and but yet we 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 work on the physical world right i mean obviously you got to have certain skills to play in the NHL or certain speed and, and certain strengths, but we spend so much time on the, in the physical world. And, but if you ask anybody, is the game more mental than physical, they're going to say mental. And if you say what percentage, you know, they're going to say 80, yeah. 80%, whatever it is. It's always a high number, but do we really work on that 80, 90%? It's really a hundred percent when you break it down, but let's just say it's 80% mental, 20% physical. Do we really work on that 80% mental? And again, with the women's Olympic team, we brought, you know, that's what we worked on. It was so much more the mental side. Uh, so it, it starts with just being aware of your thoughts and feelings. And your thoughts and feelings got to be connected, uh, Lance, because you, you may think a positive thought, but then you're, you're feeling negative about the same situation. So you're, you're not coherent. And so you have to line up your, your, your mind and 
uh, mind and body. The mind is the thought, and, and the feeling is your body. So you, you got to line those up, and and you got to be aware. So if you're having uh, a, a negative thought, a frustrated thought towards a, again a referee making a bad call, you got to be aware of that because you're just vibrating at a low frequency. You, it's impossible to play your best when you're vibrating at a low frequency. It's impossible. You can't be at your best. And so and so you just got to be aware. And so you, you've got to change that mindset and, and have a positive mindset. You know, be excited. Be uh, uh, be, be passionate. Uh, you know, just, just you know, love the situation that you're in. You know, it's okay to have obstacles come your way. Life's all about obstacles. It's okay. And so, but if, if you are keep uh, being aware of how you're thinking and feeling in these different situations, and you, and you keep changing that thought and feeling, eventually uh, it changes. And so, all of a sudden, now that same situation that used to get you frustrated or angry or upset doesn't affect you you actually feel great and excited and so okay you check the box you're, you're moving on to another connection so you just you just rewired your brain and so you said it earlier our, our brains are is, is a supercomputer. Uh, that's the best way to look at it. it's the best computer ever ever built but when i first buy a, a, an ipad it, it's hardwired just like our brains are hardwired it pumps our blood and, and, and um, you know it teaches us or tells us when to breathe and how to breathe and gives our body oxygen but to really uh, use my ipad i got to download uh you know apps like for this uh call here i had to download uh, the, the app there um or if i'm going to use microsoft excel or word or powerpoint i got to download the apps well that's the problem is that we've had these apps being downloaded since we were young and and again we've got our those apps get outdated just like our apps on a computer get outdated right we have to update them or we they get a virus so we have to cancel them out and, and, and renew them and so that's what we have to do with our brain all the time is to you know update uh, our, our wiring, make new connections. Uh, Joe Dispenza calls it breaking the habit of being yeah. yourself and because uh, the habit of ourself is not really elite. Let, let's change that habit. And then when you make all these new connections, it, 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 then they work in unison with each other. It's called a neural network. And then now you become you know more instinctive. Uh, so, so that's kind of the, the, the background of, of teaching hockey sense. You, you can teach it. You have to just make these new networks and, and then these new networks were, will work together. And all of a sudden now your sense of feeling is, is feeling the, the net, but your sense of sight is seeing a player. Well, one of your senses will override the other, whatever is a spontaneous right decision. Michael Jordan said it best. He goes, I, I don't know how anybody can defend me because I don't know what I'm going to do with the basketball until I actually <laughs> move it. <laughs> well, well, that's what's going on. He, it's called the spontaneous right decision. He, he's pointing all this information. Now, he probably doesn't know he's doing this. He was just blessed with it, like Gretzky was blessed with it. And so we say you got to be born with it. But yeah, uh, those guys are lucky that they were blessed with it. But no, you can uh, wire our brains to to think the, think like, like the greats think. So, uh, man, <laughs> I, just, I think you just punched me in the solar plex and I lost my wind because I can't breathe right now. <laughs> Uh, so awesome. <laughs> well, this, is, this is great. I, I, I love talking about this stuff, and uh, it, it's great that you're you're interested in it. Yeah. And, and again, I, I, I know you use it as yeah. well. And, you know, like when you're around people that want to achieve a higher higher level, um, you want to help them, and that's that's what we're doing. Um, you you've you've mentioned a lot of things, and I I, I think this is important. Uh, an important time to just throw it out there that so much of uh, getting good at hockey is the physical part of it, but there, there's so much more that goes into it. You know, you got your family, you got your school, uh, your schoolwork, uh, you got, as you talked about, uh, you know, do you have someone, a higher power that's in your, in your life? Um, and then we can just go on and on the, the, the physical training as far as getting stronger. Um, every year, something's added to your plate. Uh, it's not easy being elite, is it? No, 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 it's not. Uh, Herb Brooks said it best. You know, uh, you can't be a common man. Common men go nowhere. Uh, you know, it, 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 it takes work, you know, uh, and it takes a lot, a lot of drive and a lot of energy, a lot of sacrificing. And, um, and, and, and you just you, you got to keep working at it so no it's, it's, it's not easy it isn't easy but it's rewarding yeah. um so we're down here in south florida my older boy or both my boys we uh we don't see each other obviously during the the hockey season much so we reconnected down here in treasure island uh they rented a house on the beach uh, I got to give a shout out to the person that I'm staying at. Uh, my wife and I, Carrie Ace, 
My son, uh, my older boy, played at Shattuck for three years and uh, lived with the Aces uh, family for for a couple years. So we're down here. Um, what we we met with you, my older boy Rem and I, and you're 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 an inventor. You're an Einstein. Uh, you, you've come out with a, a, a hockey training product. Uh, let's touch touch base on that a little bit, and uh, because. I tried it. I couldn't figure it out in 15 minutes, so I'm looking forward to trying to get it going. What? Are, who's it for? How does it benefit hockey players? Yeah, so it's called Ultimate Hands Hockey, and uh, you know it's something that uh, I used a version of this. It's the resistance bands that uh, connect to your hockey stick on, on both sides, and so it's a very dynamic workout because you know you're getting pulled in different directions, and plus you know the the, the puck's rolling on your blade a little bit. And so it really works in the small, intricate muscles in your core and your forearms and wrist. And so it's really for, you know, speeding up your hands, uh, you know, to move pucks in and out of traffic much quicker. Again, you get to higher levels. The game's faster in different ways. You know, it's faster with the mind and, and, and faster with the body, but it's also faster uh, with the hands. And so it uh, definitely will elevate your ability to uh, – pull pucks in and out of traffic much quicker. Plus it, you know, it will strengthen just those little uh, muscles in your fingers to be stronger on pucks and, and winning, winning more stick battles. And also it, it's a workout. It's uh, again, we talk about stamina for our uh, lower body, uh, but we rarely use uh, uh, different techniques to really help our stamina in the upper body. Yeah. It, it, it kind of pissed me off when I tried it, you know, so that that's good, I guess. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. very solid, and I, I promise you, my friend, that uh, someone that is listening to this podcast is going to uh, purchase that. Um, I'm going to try to work a little discount here that I'll put in the description for everyone, uh, for the listeners that are interested in getting one for themselves, but it's, it's, it's an unbelievable product, and it's not something that you have to you know work on for, you know, 20 minutes it's spend you know 10 minutes not even five minutes probably you know you're going 30 on 30 off you yeah. know 20 on 20 off and do that for a little what? bit you know 10 minutes five minutes and then just do it consistently right yeah that's it yeah you don't need to spend hours working on it you know you know five minutes 10 minutes you know and just yeah, interval training you know 30 seconds on 30 seconds off or even you know maybe a minute off because you know you want to uh, get your arms, you know, muscles fresh again, so you can go go at top speed there. But uh, yeah, you, you, it's just the the put the time in, the, the consistency of it. You can put it in your in your garage. You can put it in your basement. You can uh, stick handle on, on smooth concrete or you know artificial ice, plastic ice, or a little sheet of plastic. So it's it's very versatile. You can use it anywhere. But yeah, it's just putting the time in. And and, and once you use it, though, you're going to see the benefits, and you're you're going to want to keep going back out to the garage or down the basement to, and spend another ten minutes using it for sure. I just, uh, the, the consistent thing that players say to me is, you know, you, you might lose a big game or something and you're mad. Um, that little space at home is your sanctuary where you can go and just escape for a little bit. And every minute counts, uh, even if it's two or three, four minutes. You compound that uh, over a month or a year uh it's 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 significant and that's there's nothing fancy about becoming really good at something um it's boring you have a lot of alone time um but if you get in front of the right people like yourself that can help guide uh a person through this process um it it can be magical uh it's awesome yeah no, it, 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 and that's what we enjoy doing is, you know, help players try to become the best version of themselves. And so uh, it's just great to uh, be able to help people that have a goal and a dream and, you know, try to get them to the next level. So that's what we've been trying to do. So um, I, I mentioned earlier that we have not chatted in probably two decades. Um, you got the the uh, Hockey International. Uh, you, you've, let me just rewind the tape here a little bit. Great career, University of Minnesota. Anyone that can play Division One hockey, success. Uh, Ten-year professional yeah. career. Uh, didn't make it to the NHL, but 
you have you did it, man. You you played longer than everyone, you know, and, that, and that's <laughs> awesome. Um, you met your wife during that journey. Uh, you have two kids. Uh, you created a business. Uh, just thank you for everything that uh, you've you've done. I mean, congratulations to everything you've done, and uh, thank you for all that you're doing now uh, and the players that you're helping. A absolutely. So, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, doing this interview. I, I really enjoy talking about, uh, you know, these, these things here and, and uh, you know, look forward to, uh, you know, reconnecting soon with you. Awesome. So just real quick, uh, if, if someone wants to connect with you, I mean, I, are you training players? Are you, the other thing we didn't talk about, and let's, one minute, I'm going to give you, uh, you own a AAA hockey club. What is that? No, it, well, no, it's, it's the Tampa Bay Juniors uh, Hockey Club. It's uh, we're actually a Tier Three Junior program, uh, and so we're, we're part of the USPHL, uh, United States Premier Hockey League, uh, and so uh, you know there's divisions all across the country. You know, it basically started uh, with the, the, the Junior Bruins and the and the Hitmen and the South Shore Canes. They've been around, yeah. and so we we've just expanded, and and so yeah, I mean, I'm very blessed to be able to be in hockey and 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 be in a, in a great state and a great city like like Tampa. Uh, and, and so uh, we have two divisions, the premier division, and, uh, and then we have a division called the elite division. It's just a little bit of a, of a younger team, but it's, it's, it's junior hockey. You know, it's a stepping stone to college hockey, you know, this day and age, uh, you know, you've pretty much got to play a year or two of juniors, you know, they, they want that older freshman. And so obviously the goal is to get players to the, uh, you know, the USHO or the North American hockey league, or they have a division called the NCDC, which is the, the tier two division of the USPHL. You know, those are the three highest junior leagues in the U.S., and that's our goal is to help elevate players uh, in, in, into those uh, uh, leagues so, so they have a better chance of maybe uh, becoming a Division One hockey player. So, so uh, yeah, my, my, my brother uh, runs the teams now and coaches them. I, uh, uh, Philip Kuba, uh, a former Kuby. teammate of yours, um, you know, is one of the coaches as well, and I uh, really enjoy it having him in our program uh, his son uh, played for us for a couple of years and now he's uh, got tendered in the ncdc so hopefully he can make the jump to the, that higher junior level we just talked about so so yeah it's uh, so so that's uh, my main uh work in the uh in the winter time um but yeah i'm you know, you know doing you know some training as much i used to have training programs all summer long but now just kind of uh, different people that they're looking for to to do that and um uh, and, and really right now my, my, my op time is, uh, is launching, uh, the ultimate hands hockey train device. Awesome. Um, I'm going to put the links to both, but how, how do people get in touch with you for hockey international and then, uh, your, your stick handling device? How do how do they find you? Uh, if, if you go to, um, hockey international.net or ultimate hands hockey.com, uh, you know, there's contact information there. Uh, Brett at hockeyinternational.net uh, is is one of my business emails there. But uh, b both websites have uh, contact information on there. Okay, awesome. I'll put the, those in the description so people can easily uh, get over to you. Um, thank you. This was, this was an awesome, uh, unexpected. Uh, I, I I couldn't have scripted a better interview. So thank you, Brett. Thank you, Lance. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Until our paths cross again, uh, thank you for sharing your hockey journey with us, and we will see you when I see you next. Sounds good. Thanks, Lance. Have a safe, safe travels. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Brett Strout and hearing his hockey journey. I love connecting with former teammates that still have hockey in their lives not now as a player, but as an instructor, coach, and mentor, and Mr. Strote wears all three hats, helping hockey players with lofty goals get closer to achieving their objectives. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and... Do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.